greater so there is there is no greater way to live life if not living it and making meaning for others so that's always my philosophy um i would say that my scholarship journey started quite um early i started in my fourth year at the university um so i means i applied in my fourth year in my final year and i got only when i was um doing my service so this was like a three years journey um i mean over time i would say that the the approach and what i've done or the approach that i used then i have of course grown up to see that i could have done certain things differently um, especially in how i handled um those early rejections right taking it personally um rather than seeing it as an opportunity to to grow not the scholarship itself but the journey gives you the opportunity to grow um so another area i would say is like i was fortunate to have started early um you know the first thing that i learned was that um when it comes to scholarship because of the level and the type of competitions that are within it um it's difficult for you to rule out that aspect of your own life and your own destiny versus you thinking um i gave this person a link and then he got the scholarship but i did not get it i have a better um, i graduated with the first class this person got a 2 1 why is he getting and i'm not getting so when you also see it as your own personal growth like the jet the scholarship itself is not an end of itself right um it's not the end it is just a means to that end when you see it that way it helps you to deal with the different um rejection so i would say in summary for me um and also as a, um as an advice i tell my mentees to see it as a process and to trust the process versus the result mm. so the result could be for you like that you got the award but for me i am focused more on what did i learn in this scholarship process and what did i learn those things that i learned for example does it help me to identify the gap i need to close does it help me to identify skills that i need to learn yeah. so with the with each scholarship year you become a better version of yourself and i think when you look at it this way you do not take those rejections personally but you see them as you know that opportunity for you to build up the resilience that you need to move forward Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kiss. I think one thing everybody should take from that is resilience. Is uh, that it's not don't take it personally. It's about uh, a bigger picture. It's not just about uh, you have first class. So it's, it's not it's not just about studying. It's not just about cramming and going to study or going forward to just because everybody is doing PhD, they have to do a PhD. It's more than that. It's about having a bigger picture for yourself. So. Uh, Dio, let's hear from you by uh, your, your experience and uh, some of the just one of the, some of the key lessons you've learned so far. All right, so I will just uh, try to break them into three. I hope I will be able to discuss those three with, uh, within the uh, time allotted to me. But one thing I actually uh, learned is um, going all in, and I would advise people to go all in because when you tell people about scholarships, and of course when you tell them about the requirements. Many people will tell you, oh, I know some guy who never wrote GRE, who never wrote IELTS, who never did anything, who they just accepted just the way it was, you know. Um, and there are always all these stories flying about. In fact, I personally, um, I believe that I've gotten quite a number of scholarships um, without, you know, doing the extra. But I would not advise people to, because, you know, mediocre is not, mediocrity is not a really good strategy. I would mm -hmm. always want you to add more to yourself, you know, to increase yourself and to go all in. You do every single thing you can because your life depends, as if your life depend, depends on it, because it does. Uh, so I would advise people to go all in. You know, if you can afford to write the GRE, write it. If you can afford to like raise the money for um, your TOEFL, please do. Um, it is very, very important to go all in. Uh, you know, your mind would even be at rest. Uh, there was this particular school that I applied to, but I knew that uh, my application was not so strong and, you know, I, I just did it half, half at the end. Although I got the scholarship, but before I got it, until I got it out, my mind was not at rest. So I would advise people to go all in. Do give it all you've got, you know. Uh, there are quite a number of ways you could go all in. 
make sure you talk to professors. You know, even if on the website they say, oh, you don't need to talk to professors, just just chill and apply. Don't do that. Don't listen to them. Uh, you know, <laughs> talk to professors. Um, uh, if you can uh, collaborate on papers, get your papers written. And please make sure that you write those exams, you know, because uh, those results would actually speak for you. There are quite a number of people that they would admit and those who have, you know, difficulty speaking English and, and all that. There are quite a number of students that have regretted such processes. So uh, students that are able to give the proof that they can, they are proficient in English or that they, are, that they have good critical uh, thinking skills and all that, those students would definitely get an edge. Please give it all you've got, go all in. That's one. And uh, secondly, I would say, uh, that you, em, environment really matters because this admission uh, process, uh, if you've heard uh, what Dr. Dr. Folarami said the other time, he was talking about how, how lengthy the process could, uh, can actually be in, in, in terms of how, how much it takes, how long it takes you to prepare. And one thing you would know is, if you have actually tried it, is that these things are really tedious. You know, sometimes you, you are, like it's, it's a very lonely journey. So I would advise that you always, always get into uh, the right environment, you know, uh, get into groups, get into uh, conversations and just just get in touch with people who are actually going to the same place. And of course, when you uh, do that, you would find out that even when you are down, someone is doing the same, uh, someone, some, someone is also running the process and the person is encouraging you. And that kind of stuff would, would keep you going, of course. And I would advise you to be strategic. And um, my time is up. Yeah. Uh, so you sorry about that. I was using a stopwatch and uh, just right. notified you too. Okay. Um, okay. Just briefly about what you said. Go all in. Okay. Go all in. And you gave you gave a point that uh, even like you should you should be stubborn about it. Let me put it that way because your life depends on it. Okay. I, and I like that point. Sometimes I, I've been in, like I think I've also sometimes not put everything like my effort and love and not writing the exams, I guess. But uh, we, I hope, I hope uh, someone is learning from this. I hope someone is learning from this. Okay, Joshua, uh, Dr. Joshua, let's go ahead. Let's see. Once again, good evening, everybody. I think from my own experience, I would like to give everybody just two or three points of advice. The first one is, the importance of your network. When it comes to scholarship and, and its application, one thing you need to know is the level of information at your disposal will determine the strength of your scholarship. So you need to work on your network. Move to people, people who have gone ahead of you, people who are already in the process, you have one or two things to learn from them. Then number two, be flexible. Flexibility in the sense of the country. For some people, it's either US or no other country. Mm. If you are rigid with a particular country, then you would stay long. But if you are flexible, take for example, in my own case, I started my master's in South Korea, an Asian country. After my master's, moved to Europe for, a, for my PhD. If I'm fixated on, okay, it's either US or Europe, probably maybe I will still be in Nigeria now. Then still on the area of flexibility also, be flexible in the choice of your course. I'm speaking from the life science point of view. In the life science, there are different routes to the same destination. So if you are particular about a country, about a course, it's either this course or not, then you might keep on applying and applying and then having the same rejection. Still using myself as an example, I had my background in microbiology. My first degree was in microbiology, but my master's was in protein biochemistry, and now my PhD in neuroscience. That is life science for you. The way things are going now, management of diseases, management of infections, it's, it's interrelated. One leads to another. So your network, be flexible. And then finally, Dr. Kelesh already said that resilience. Every scholarship application is an opportunity for you to learn something new. You will always learn something from the process. How not to do it the next time or how to do it better the next time. So whenever you see any opportunity, put in for it. You, are, you either have it or you are rejected. But even with the rejection, you have learned something from it. Somebody said failure is first attempt in learning. And the first attempt is always the first step. 
And so from that, you would have gained meaningful experience to make your application better the next time. I think I would stop at that point. I, th I, th I really think that was the first attempt in learning. I used to know uh, that no means next opportunity. Well, this time I had fail, first attempt in learning, and I think that was really deep and strong. Uh, it's, it's a well-communicated message to everybody. Uh, sorry, I can't, okay. Yeah, so it's a strong message that, that I think should resonate with everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Jisha, for that word. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll just quickly talk about, uh, in, in one minute, uh, I would allow, because I, I, I think Dr. Sorry. I think Dr. Casey has, um, is already uh, working. It's, it's no longer in the loop for applying for the PhD right now. But uh, I would ask uh, Dayo and Joshua specific questions. So what would you have done differently or what would you do again if you are to apply now? If you are applying for another one, what would you have done differently? What would you do again? All right, um, should I go first? Yeah, yeah. you're free. Okay, so uh, what I would do again, I would, I would say that getting in touch with prospective supervisors is something that I would definitely, definitely never have had. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's really tiring when you send tens of mails and you don't get a response. And of course, after maybe your, your 120th mail and someone says, maybe I would have you, you know, you get tired after a while, but it's it's something that you have to do, say every single day, uh, maybe send 20 emails or send 10 and, and, and do it over time. And after say two months, you know, you sent a lot, a whole lot, 60 times, times 10 is like 600. And of course you would get a really good uh, stuff if you work by the numbers. So I, I usually say like there's miracle in the numbers. The more the the more you try, the luckier you get. Um. So please definitely get in touch with professors. It's it's really important. It gives you peace of mind, and and of course, um, you know, if, uh, during my application, actually, uh, quite a number of professors reached out to me, and out out of the three that reached out to me, two of them uh, gave me full funding. So I, I rejected those positions because, of course, I got uh, something better. But I would say that uh, apart from the last one that I got, every single um, application that I made, uh, particularly for this last session. I add a physical, sorry, I add some touch with somebody in the faculty. So I would say definitely try to uh, be in touch with someone, send mails to professors, tell them that you'd like to work in their labs. And I believe that that would make you stand out. Yeah, I, I think I'll come back to you on that, on how to code mail professors. Uh, that, that's a very good point. Uh, Joshua, quickly. To add to what that you already said, I think if I'm to turn back the end of time and then make some correction of what I had done. I think for me, I would better sell myself to my prospective supervisors more than I did when I was applying. Yeah, because your statement of purpose is a document of how you are able to sell yourself, what you can bring to the table, what you are able to offer. Yeah, I'm talking from my experience in Europe. I applied even though I had my master's in South, in South Korea, when applying, I lost count of the number of rejections I had. It got to a point, the moment the rejection, the rejection mail comes in, I read, I, I delete, I move to the next application. <laughs> so, but then all through these procedures, I learned something, my, my statement of purpose. I was fortunate, one of the professors I applied to then in Germany gave a feedback. So that feedback really helped me in my subsequent application. I will not to address a professor in Europe. You don't address them with their professor, sir. <laughs> there, is, there is a certain way they would want you to address them. So stuff like that turns them off, even without going through your documents. <laughs> so the way you address them, what you tell them, this professor told me uh, as, 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 as a PI, he, 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 he accepts large volume of applications this. So there are basic requirements you would expect in your application. Once it's not there, you are, yes. but without even reading your document, you are out of the line directly. So there is a way you sell yourself. There is a way you give the first impression. There is a way you let the professor or your PI know that, okay, you've gone through his, his profile. You know what is working on and you are interested and how is specific interest aligned with yours. 
So for me, the way I sell myself to my to my prospective PI would be one thing if I have the opportunity to turn back the end of time to correct, because that okay. would add more strength to my application. Okay, that, that was nice. Uh, about uh, that, I think I will see ask that question again, because you said, dear professor, sir, uh, I've, I do that as well. I don't use, sir, I don't, I don't combine professor and sir together anyways, but uh, you can still, later on, you would enter on how to write that. It's, uh, it's a very good, it's a very good point. Okay, Dr. Casey, I wanted to tell us uh, about how the application in Germany differs from, uh, say, okay, you were from Germany, but say Europe generally, how it differs from, say, that of Asia, that of uh, United States. Do you have any ideas or pointers to that? Yeah, um, I would say that. So, I mean, on on the on the surface, you have to think about um, the application or the graduate studies program in Europe and in the US. Um, they are not structured the same. Um, so, for example, in Europe, you have to do a master's right, before doing a PhD. Um, and the master's is typically, except for the UK, most universities in Europe would do a two years master's. Um, in, the, in the US, you could go straight into a PhD program. Um, and the PhD program is designed in such a way that the first year you are not doing kind of research, you are not doing research. You are getting first into like, getting familiar with the different experimental processes you go some do short visits into different labs um if you were hired by a particular professor this is also the time where you are doing some graduate assistantship and taking courses so you take a lot of courses in your first year and you have to take a qualification exam sometime after one and a half year or just after one year so this is somehow combined with the masters because you have two you have five years in europe it will be two plus three, so two years for master's, three years for PhD, ideally. In the US, it would be five years. So it is kind of one and a half year for, you know, this pre-PhD, then three and a half year for the actual research or more. So it's at least five years. And also when it comes to application and funding, um, what I've seen is that um, in, in, in Europe, right, if you are applying for funding, you have specific scholarships that are open to fundings. For example, Erasmus Mundus funds you across different universities. Um, if you are coming to Germany specifically, you are going to likely for STEM programs, 90% of the time, or even let's say 85%, come into a graduate um, tuition free, right? So you don't have to pay a tuition. So you only have to take care of yourself. Um, in the US or in let's say in the UK, this is not the case. Let's use UK as an example. In the UK, if it's not a full funding program, um, or if it's not a 50%, even if it's a 50%, you have to still pay for, for um, the 50% that is also going to end on like 10,000 pounds, even at the 50%. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense in my opinion. Yeah. Um, in the US, the one of the good thing I like about the US is that, if you align yourself, of course, our conversation is on Europe, but just to put the U.S. in perspective, in the U.S., you do not get like, you know, all these top calling scholarship programs that fund thousands of people per year, like, say, Erasmus Mundus. But each university, most universities have their own funding. And most of these professors at the level of even joining into a PhD from bachelor have their funding. So it's it's possible to hire you as an assistant, um, graduate assistant, and pay you during that um, during that period of your studies. But in Europe, if you are not coming in with a specific scholarship, say either you're coming with that for Germany, mostly that, um, or Erasmus Mundus, um, specifically for universities in Europe, it's difficult to find as a master's student inside a university sufficient funding to cover your studies. Mm. I guess um, we also have maybe Dio and Joshua have some things to add to what I've said. Yeah, yeah, surely. Uh, I think that uh, for those that are on this call, you really need to take note of what you just said about the, because it's, it's a different landscape when you are in uh, Germany 
versus when you're in, I mean, when you're in Europe generally versus, you, even UK is different from Europe these days, and uh, versus the United States. Uh, okay, so uh, one thing before we go forward, if you have a question, kindly type it in the chat box, uh, because if we have to allow you to unmute, it might take some time. You can just put it in the chat, and then I'll, I'll read it out and ask the right person. Okay, uh, Dr. Casey and Joshua seem to, okay, let me ask Joshua, because since you are in Asia and Europe together, and we are looking forward to you in the North, in, in the North Americas, uh, use the chat box, don't raise your hand. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so uh, tell us about how you think Asian, Asian uh, scholarship programs are different from C Europe and uh, United States. Yeah, I think from my from my experience, because for my masters, I my masters was funded through the Korean government scholarship program. So, and I think for most schools in Asia, for most schools in Asia, if you are applying through the government fund, if you're applying for the government funded scholarship, South Korea, a case note, you need to study the language for one year. Awesome. You study the language for a year, and before you are allowed to to start your master's or your graduate program, you are expected to pass the language at a certain proficiency level. So that I that I'm double sure with South Korea. If in South Korea, if you are go, if you are coming in through the professor scholarship, with the professor scholarship, you may not be asked to study the language. But then with the professor scholarship. Your year of graduation, so to say, somehow is at the mercy of your professor. <laughs> but with the government funded program, they know that after two years, the funding ends. Right. So as a matter of fact, as take for example, as a, as a Korean government scholar, after my two years, the funding stop. So within two years, they will allow you work and then you have something to allow you go. But mm -hmm. with a professor scholarship, as long as the funding is there and they discover you are a good brain to be made use of, they keep mm. prolonging your graduation. Mm. Then in, in Europe, I applied to different countries in Europe. I have experience with Sweden, Amsterdam, Switzerland for some programs in the life science. Now I'm talking with my experience in, life, in the life science. In the life sciences for their PhD program, for some of the programs, have, they do have an age cap. For a PhD at certain age, your application will no longer be strong. I think I applied to some, I think it's 28 or so. They, they would in part as part of the application requirement, they will tell you if you are at this I'm age, if you are born after this particular age, don't apply. Then another experience I have with Europe with Europe in the life sciences, most of the pro, most of the PhD program is. Is advertised through a PhD, a PhD call, what we call a PhD call. So the application is sent out. You send, you submit your application. You, they have different projects by different PI. You choose your interest. Then each of the PIs would interview you at their level. They will recommend you. Once you are recommended, you move to the next stage. And then with that, there will be a general call where as a master student, you come, you present your master's thesis in front of all the PIs. They will evaluate you. Then if you scale through, you do <laughs> what they call lab, lab, lab round. You visit yeah. all the lab in the, in the program. Then after that, you are awarded a scholarship. Okay. And I think in my experience in Europe, for the PhD in life sciences, so to say, as a PhD student, you are employed as a staff not as a student. Yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. <laughs> you are employed as a staff. So that is the that is the setting. In South Korea or Asia, you are a student. Student, But in yeah. Europe, you are a staff. staff so that, those are part of the little, little differences between the two okay. continents, so to say. Uh, okay, let me quickly go back to Dr. Casey. So someone, uh, like there is a review that to what you just said. I said, where can we find scholarship programs then? Uh, because based on what you said, is UK not really a good option for scholarship programs? No, that's not what I said. So what I said is that if you are looking for a place where you would get um, some 
I mean, let, let me rephrase. Okay. You have Chivinin, you have Chivinin, you have Commonwealth, you have um, Melinda Gates, you have um, um, some other presidential awards in, um, that are in different universities. I know there is one in Leeds, there's one in Oxford. So, yes, you have these scholarships, but um, these are also scholarships that have some conditions, right, especially with coming back to your country. Um, I know this is true for Chivinin, it's true for Commonwealth. Um, such that if you have such an award for one year, you would have to come back to your country. That's part of the part of the conditions. Um, but if I'm looking at countries that offer, except recently, that um, you have a chance of staying back in the UK, but not if you call, if you came through Chivinin or Commonwealth, that you can stay back and apply for a job. Um, that's not the case with Europe, um, at least for Germany. Um, in Germany, after your master's, you can you are given 18 months to look for a job, right? So there is that post-study um, visa. Um, of course, that is enough time for you to like decide if you want to move into a PhD route. And just like, um, like Joshua said, a PhD is a job. Um, so it's something to put at the back of your mind. You are doing, you are employed full-time. So your research is your job. And so you will not probably have time to maybe do other things outside of full-time research. But then you have that chance of staying back. And since you do a PhD, especially if it's not a scholarship, so if it's a professor's funding, um, you can, because you pay tax as a PhD student, if you end up with your PhD before getting a job, you get what they call unemployment money because you have been paying tax Right. So <laughs> at least this is what is specific for specific for Germany. Um, but so not to be misquoted, yes, you can always find um, certain scholarships in the UK and Chivinin and Commonwealth are among the top and most um, prestigious awards you have anywhere. Ah, OK, nice. Thank you very much. OK, uh, Dayo, I, I want to come back to you quickly. Uh, because we have very like five minutes left, I'm not getting much questions, so I'll just go on with the general questions that I'm giving to you. So you said that you talked about code mailing, right? The other time. So can you give us some very quick action tips for co sending code emails? All right. So one thing I would I would just want to let you know is that there are quite a number of professors. Every professor receives, uh, you know tons of meals every single day. So you have to first ensure that your title is catchy and of course that your emails are not generic. But now that leaves us with the question uh, of how deep can you get when mailing one professor, when you know that sometimes you have to send more than 300 emails. So I would suggest that at least you read their abstract to at least give you um, a, an idea of what they are doing. So um, for example, if I just, as a professor, if you read the message and you, you have a feel that this particular message would be sent to like 50 other professors, you would not bother to respond. So I would say that you customize as your meals, uh, at least to, to give an highlight of the professor's research and to show that you at least understand uh, what you are talking about. And if you know that, uh, that you cannot really talk about you know, the professor's work too deeply, at least talk about your strengths and, and, and why you should have it in your lab. And please make sure that you, um, you, you, you highlight your feet because it's important to actually, uh, for you to point out to your professor that what you are, the experiences that you have had has prepared you to succeed in his lab. So I would suggest that you highlight your feet and of course that you at least read the abstract. I think it's important. You, you might not be able to read your paper, or read the abstract before um, before sending mails. Okay, so uh, I've taken a group picture already anyways, but I want everybody to switch on their cameras. Uh, if you can just uh, smile and say cheese so that I can take another picture. Uh, okay. okay, in the meantime, I'm still waiting for more questions anyways. Uh, okay, I've taken one. I'm taking another. I okay. would just add up to something that Dio said that I think is very important. Um, yeah, please do. And I think I should have also said it from the beginning. Um, scholarship is a job, okay? Um, it's something that you should keep put at the back of your mind that applying for scholarship is a full-time job. If you, 
of course, full time could mean many things, right? It could mean that you have a job that you are doing, but also consider that it's not just click and submit. Um, some of them takes quite a lot of process, like writing to a professor. I always tell my mentees one thing, um, less is more. It's better mm -hmm. to send one good email to a professor than sending 100 that none of them are good enough. You just increase the chance of how many love letters you will receive. <laughs> yeah, because you just, you put yourself in a condition where there could be a reason why they would not read your email, right? So it's better to do it. If you want to do it, do it well. If you want to say you are interested in going through the route of cold emails to professors, you could schedule your time that you do it. You apply, you write to one professor in a week. Don't overdo it. Just one professor in a week is like 50 professors in a year. It makes more sense than wanting to, like I when I started applications, I did some nights, 20 emails. You know, I would pick up the name of a professor, put the same generic stuff, change the name, change the lab, submit, pick the next person, change. No, you are not helping yourself. So um, just to add up to what he said, you need to personalize the email. The question is not whether they will read it. What if they want to read it, right? So make sure that you do not keep yourself at the mercy of things that you should have managed. So very important. Dayo, that was a good, very good tip. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, our sessions will be closing now. Uh, for those requesting for scholarship ideas, um, Upper Lua will send uh, more but to you guys, uh, more detailed information to you guys, and then we, you can take it up from there yourself. But I think you must have been inspired personally and privately. Uh, so it's really nice time speaking to you guys. Uh, I would yes. personally connect to everybody. Uh, I, would, I would share my LinkedIn details later on. But it's been nice talking to Joshua, talking to Dr. Casey, talking to DY, if I can call you that. Uh, okay, uh, sure. And I hope to see everyone at the top. Dr. Casey, I'm coming to Germany very soon. I'll probably see you. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I just submitted a YouTube video that I did on step-by-step um, -step applications to scholarship. I guess that helps some people. It's okay. on the link. On the yeah, chat I'll just yeah, I'll just copy it and 